Um, before we start, if everyone can please take your cell phones and put it on to silence before we start. Thank you. Okay, if you have noticed, Rabbi Mintz is not here tonight. He had a wedding. So instead we have a real friend of Ura, Rabbi Bohm, who works in the Zone Boys Division and is involved in many other Ura programs. So it's actually Rabbi Bohm's first time here at Torah Spot tonight. And he is very knowledgeable in the topic of kashras and kosher. And he's going to share with us a presentation followed by questions on the topic of kosher. So just to start, I have to say it's a big honor to be here. Sitting in Rabbi Mintz's seat is not something I could take lightly. Um, I've spent many years looking up to Rabbi Mintz, and I normally wouldn't have accepted such an opportunity, but knowing how much Rabbi Mintz always sacrifices in his schedule to make this to be a weekly, consistent place where he comes to is a testament to how he views the crowd and views the group over here. And following in those footsteps, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here with everybody uh, today. The topic at hand is Kosher 101. Keeping kosher in the modern world. In a way, we're fortunate, and in a way, we're somewhat at a disadvantage. We are fortunate by the fact that the United States of America is unique in the fact that there's such a strong movement of kosher eating Jews, no matter where you go, where you travel and I do get some travel time, and wherever I go, there's always some place within reach that you can avail yourself of kosher food, and definitely of packaged food in most large supermarkets and establishments. In Europe, it's not that way in many places. For Passover, even here in the United States, there's many people who live their lives with lists, where you have to take out this book and check out this product. And it's frustrating that you need to know, could I use this cosmetic, could I use this, and I have to check it out in the Passover books. Imagine living the entire year that way. And that's how it's done in many countries outside the US, where there's rabbis who don't even have full access to the factories. They're working on a lot of assumptions. They're working on some research where they could get a certain level of comfortability that certain products they could eat. In the United States of America, we're really fortunate that we have direct access, and it's a trickle-down effect. It started years ago. Coca-Cola was one of the real pioneers to accept a uh, kosher supervision, and they have seen their sales go up significantly. Kosher consumers aren't the only ones that are responsible for their sales increase. People of the Muslim faith who only eat halal, and part of halal is that it has to be an animal that is slaughtered by a descendant of Abraham, which Jewish slaughter qualifies for that. We can't eat halal, but they could eat kosher. And they're, they're a market for that. There's people who just think, and to some degree it is true, that kosher food is just cleaner and healthier and better. So there's people who, and there's studies done where they just go shopping, and if they see a kosher symbol, they'll purchase that item. And then the Orthodox Union actually did a market study where there's people who don't know anything about kosher, don't know anything about a symbol, but they'll just pick up two bottles of ketchup that look identical the same, 
Just one has some weird symbol on it that they don't even know what it represents, and they'll just take that and put that into their shopping cart. So these numbers, these statistics, and the demand, which is the largest portion of kosher-eating Jews, created enough of an interest in companies for them to allow kosher supervision to come in, and many of them had to even alter their processes on how they produce food. So to that, we're very fortunate. My, my rabbi, Rabbi Belsky, Zechreina Lavracha, I was once talking to him about certain topics of dealing with people of less religious background. What things should you try to encourage them first? They're taking baby steps in life, and what steps should you encourage them first? Keeping Shabbat is very important, right? We identify somebody as being a Shomer Shabbat. That's a category of your being religious and Jewish. However, it comes with a lot of challenges. And he recommended, he said, one of the easiest, I shouldn't say easiest things, one of the easier things that someone could accept upon themselves in their road towards improving their Judaism is keeping kosher just because of the availability. And it does involve some level of sacrifice, like everything does, but it's a lot easier because we have such, a, such an availability. Now, What's harder these days is products. So, for example, years ago, people would take a package of food, they would look on the back of the label, and they would see, does it say pig? Does it say anything else that you can't have? And it's always helpful to be familiar with some of the fancier terms. And if it doesn't have any of the main ingredients that you know you have to stay away from, you could, produce, you could consume that product. In this day and age, in this day and age, that's really not the case, unfortunately or fortunately. The food service industry, the chemical labs on how they research and experiment various different types of flavors, additions, and reactions in order to be able to produce an end product is as sophisticated as it ever was. There's no such thing as a simple product. There's flavors, which we'll talk about, that come from a wide array of sources. There's, we'll talk about enzymes, stabilizers, emulsifiers, all different types of things to produce certain reactions that are kosher, what we call kosher sensitive ingredients. And you're not gonna get that just from looking at a label. Additionally, you have to know what the words mean. So for example, if you see popular in a lot of medication, magnesium stearate, stearate, stearic acid, comes from animals animals that are not slaughtered. So now you have stearic acid, you have magnesium stearate in your food. Medications is a separate conversation which I don't know if we'll have time to cover today, but you have meat, food ingredients that came from a non-kosher source or from an animal that wasn't slaughtered that is of a significant proportion, because otherwise they wouldn't put it into the product if it didn't do anything, if it didn't contribute any flavor. Now, there could be other leniencies in some cases, but I'm just talking about on a high level. Now you have a kosher-sensitive product that you normally wouldn't have recognized. So looking at a label 40 years ago, 30 years ago, perhaps, might have been sufficient in some products. In this day and age, many products just say natural flavors. The USDA, the government, does not require them to list where do these flavors come from, because often the flavors could be a concoction of many minute flavors to produce a outcome, and they're not required to list that. And many of them could be, come from non-kosher sources. For example, Castorium, this is a, f a flavor that's very, very popular. In the United States, the FDA lists castorium extract as, ge as a generally recognized safe food additive. 
It's used in foods and beverages as part of a substitute for vanilla flavor. It's sometimes used for raspberry and strawberry flavoring. Where does it come from? It comes from beavers. Now, you're going to see on the food label natural flavors. At best, you might even see castorium. All right, what is this? Probably some chemical reaction of some proteins, and we look at uh, the health benefits of it. This is a very popular flavor food additive. Civet, it comes from an African cat, from the cat family. Very popular as a flavor. Carmine, carmine comes from an extract of insects, insects similar to the beetles, where it's ground up and it's commonly used to produce a very cherry flavor looking dye, which very often, if you see cherries, you know, you go to a wedding, what could be wrong with some nice, colorful, red looking cherries? They could be colored, it's used as a food coloring very often, that comes from carmine. And carmine is, if you want to view it as ground beetle, a ground, it's ground beetles, basically, it's, it comes from an insect. There is another type of glaze, which is very popular in kids' candies, confectioner's glaze, also known as shellac. It's a resin which is secreted from the female lac insect after it consumes tree sap. And you can see an image right there of it being on the tree, how it looks, and it gets processed. So that, Rabbi Feinstein has an opinion which he wrote a lengthy tshuva that he felt that it doesn't actually come from the actual body of the animal. It comes from an excretion of, of the animal. It's also something that is considered a waste product that's not really edible until it gets processed into a different set of substance. And therefore, he felt that was permitted. However, sometimes... We're not here to forbid everything. You have to research it, and there's principles that we follow. But this is just another derivative of an animal that, in this case, it is permitted. Carmine would not be permitted. So again, you get the same desired outcome, two different ingredients, two different sources. Oil, very, very common ingredient. Oil comes from three sources. Oil could be produced from animal fats, which are obviously not kosher. Oil could come from petroleum, rock oil. Oil could also be vegetable oil, coming from vegetable fats. So someone's going to say, hey, two out of the three sources are kosher, right? If it comes from vegetables, vegetable oil is kosher. Petroleum, rock oil, what could be not kosher about rock oil? Animal fats is only one out of three. So obviously, you don't look at Rove as a majority of being two out of three categories. You have to see where most of the supply comes from. But unfortunately for us, if there's no kosher supervision, the purchasers of oil, they don't care about the source. In, many, in most cases, they don't care about the source of the oil. They want oil. And therefore, the refineries and the plants that are producing oil try to get their hands on as much oil as possible, regardless of the source. They mix them all together in order to produce a bottle of oil, unless... It's a unique bottle of oil, like olive oil, or something that's clearly labeled uh, as such. So research has to be, what's the source of the oil? And oil could be used just to, like someone's going to say, bread. Could I buy bread in a non-kosher bakery? What could be wrong with flour and water? What are the sheet pans sprayed with? So the dough doesn't stick to it. Are they using an oil that's from a kosher source, or are they using an oil from a non-kosher source? In order to give a certain lacquer to the bread, is some oil smeared on it? What's the source of that oil? So now suddenly, even a staple food item, such as bread, is no longer a mixture of flour and water and heat. Now, when we're getting into products, there's kosher-sensitive ingredients that aren't only there for color or for flavors. Emulsifiers. What's an emulsifier? To, 
to explain it very simply, anybody think about when you take a shower and your body's full of sweat and grease, how do you get your body cleansed? Use soap. How does soap work? So there's many people who have a custom when they're lighting Hanukkah candles and they're using oil and they don't want the glass to crack, so they pour a little water first into the glass and then they pour oil on it. You ever notice what happens? The oil rises to the top, the water rises, uh, uh, falls to the bottom. Oil and water naturally don't mix. An emulsifier causes oil and water to mix. Soap, which is very, very highly concentrated, often it comes from, from tallow, from animal fats, and has glycerin in it, and other such sources, is very concentrated with an emulsifier. And what that does, it causes the oil, the grease that's on your body, to mix with the water of the shower, and suddenly, as the water drips off your body, it takes all that grease and oil with it. So if not for emulsifiers, we would not be able to be clean. Emulsifiers are very, very much used in food production because they need to achieve a certain outcome. In chocolate production, emulsifiers are used in order to combine certain ingredients. Peanut butter, in order for the oil base not to get separated. And for years, it took a while until they were able to figure out the exact recipe to have peanut butter as we have today, but it comes from the chemical lab where they do various different experiments. One of the popular emulsifiers that are used is glycerin. Glycerin is, is a natural component from oil. Oil could come from animal fats, vegetable, petroleum. When they're buying glycerin in bulk, often it gets mixed together, it's not identified as the source of the glycerin, and now, here, you're not even putting it in for flavor, although glycerin is a sweet-tasting substance. Um, my Rebbe, Rabbi Belsky, he was challenged very often when people came to him and said, yeah, glycerin it probably doesn't taste good. So he had a bottle in his drawer in his office of obviously a kosher source of glycerin, but it all tastes the same. And whenever he was challenged with that, he would open up his drawer, pull it out, pour it on a teaspoon and say, here, taste it. Very sweet tasting. And I've seen articles written where people say, hey, it, it, it's, it, it, one of the concepts are, you know, it's not even edible for a dog. It's not fit for human consumption. It's not cold food. Suddenly, and it's amazing how people write articles that aren't well researched, but you can taste it. You can go to a pharmacy and you can buy glycerin. Taste it. Gelatin. Gelatin comes either from the bones of animals, or most popular comes from the tissue of animals. And years ago, there were a lot of responses that were written by a lot of great rabbis looking to try to find some leniency for gelatin because it is a popular ingredient. And based on information on how it was produced and information that they had, some permitted it. But unfortunately, today, most gelatin is actually produced from animal fats, from tissue within animals, and many of those original leniencies are not applicable. Marshmallows, very popular. It's done with gelatin. And you would have to have a kosher source for it. Stabilizers, ice cream. What could be wrong with ice cream, right? Ice cream, you mix some uh, milk, some sugar, some eggs, and now you get ice cream. In order to get the smooth texture of flowing good ice cream, there's stabilizers that are put in. It could also come in from non-kosher sources. Enzymes are used all the time for chemical reactions in the cheese making process. How do you get the cheese to curdle? How do you get any type of chemical reaction to happen? So this is just a taste. Chocolate we spoke about, as delicious and as good as it looks, chocolate is not necessarily as simple as it, as it may sound. All right, I'm becoming a vegetarian. I'm going vegan. I, 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 I know too much. You know, there's an old expression, a person wants to go on a diet, go into an industrial kitchen. You're not going to want to eat half the food that's produced there. Years ago, 
I had a uh, opportunity, I took a tour with a uh, group of rabbis in some of Manhattan's finest hotels. Four five-star hotels that charge a few hundred dollars a night to stay there. You walk in the lobby, it's beautiful, it's stunning, it's gorgeous. The grand ballroom, beautiful. As soon as you go past the doors of where guests are allowed, you know, where it says employees only, you see this sharp contrast on how the walls aren't painted, there's no carpet, there's like where they try saving money, they do it everything possible to save money behind the scenes. And their kitchens, I'm talking about five-star hotels in Manhattan, the grease that's, that's oozing off the doors is in, in many of these uh, hotels, or off the oven doors. And they clean it every once in a while, but that's what happens in mass food production. You know, you walk in there, it's like suddenly the food is not as appetizing as it appears when, it, when the waiter serves it. So a guy exposed to that will say, hey, I want to become vegetarian. What's the difference between a vegetarian and a vegan? So neither vegans nor vegetarians eat meat. However, vegetarians tend to consume dairy products and eggs. A vegan avoids all animal products, including eggs, dairy, and often inedible animal-based products such as leather, wool, silk. They totally stay away from it. And the best way to put it is vegetarianism is usually a diet, while veganism is a lifestyle. So a kosher eating Jew is traveling. He looks at his app. No kosher restaurants nearby. There's a beautiful vegetarian establishment. There's a vegan establishment. They're not going to be serving any meat. I don't have to worry about animal fats. What could be wrong? The answer is a few things. There's wine, cheese, eggs, and vegetables. Wine. Wine. We're not allowed to consume wine that wasn't produced from beginning to end of the process, handled only by a Jewish individual. That's a rabbinic decree. It used to be in the times of idol worship, and to this day, if you travel to India, there's certain ceremonial sacrifices that involve wine, and in order to avoid intermarriage, and in order to avoid idol worship, there was guidelines that was put that you can't go ahead and consume wine that was handled by a non-Jewish person. I was once asked by uh, someone who's in, somewhat antagonistic, and it was clearly he wasn't looking for a real answer. And he asked me, come on, what's the difference between kosher wine and non-kosher wine? Does the rabbi really bless it? So I turned to him and I said, no, kosher wine, they wash their feet before they stomp the grapes. I don't think the person wanted to consume non-kosher wine for a while. But we can't have non-kosher wine. Vegans and vegetarians consume wine. And if wine is mixed into a product or is a flavor enhancer, there goes your vegan vegetarian restaurant. Cheese. Cheese would obviously be only a threat by vegetarians, not by vegans. But cheese that are not kosher certified have a problem. Why? What could be wrong with cheese? The way cheese is manufactured, how do you produce cheese? You milk a cow, and then you go ahead and you put in some enzymes into the cheese. You could try it at home. Take a cup of milk. I mean, our milk is not going to really come out that way because it's already pasteurized, which means it's already um, heated in order to kill any bacteria. But pour a little lemon juice into it. You'll see a chemical reaction where it starts turning into something that looks somewhat like cottage cheese. It won't taste that well but you can see the chemical reaction. So rennet is one of the popular enzymes used for cheese-making processes. Rennet could come from a kosher source, or like microbial rennet, which either is artificially produced or comes from uh, veg vegetables, or rennet could come from animals. The stomach lining of a cow, a cow has who knows how many stomachs? Anybody? Four stomachs. Four stomachs. One of the stomachs, the Abel Mason, which we call the keva in uh, halacha, resembles very closely our own stomach. 
In some of the stomachs, there's a grinding effect. In other places, in other stomach, there's a rotting effect where it just decays. The abomasum is a stomach that functions very similarly to our stomachs. The stomach lining of that stomach is very rich of enzymes. The ancient legend is there was an Indian that was once traveling, and he wanted to preserve his milk. And he filled up the stomach of a cow, a young calf, with milk for his travels to function like a canteen. And when he got to his destination, he opened it up, and there was no milk there. There was cheese. And they realized it's very rich in enzymes. It caused the curdling of cheese. It caused the curds to rise. Obviously, if it comes from a non-kosher source, it's not kosher if the animal isn't slaughtered. And based on that, the rabbis made a decree that unless there is supervision, even if I know that it came from a microbial or a vegetarian source, in the cheese-making process, a Jew has to be involved. Eggs. What could be wrong with an egg? Well, there's another concept called bishal akum. Bishal akum means if a non-Jew cooked it and he cooked a food that is a respectable dish, something that you serve on a state dinner, it's forbidden for a Jew to eat. And again, it's not a biblical prohibition, it's a rabbinical prohibition, but it was done in order to avoid intermarriage and avoid association with non-Jews that you're going to end up having a debt of gratitude. A non-Jew just made you, you know, a beautiful, delicious steak and a meal. The way to a person is through his stomach. Now you're going to feel a debt of gratitude. So there are certain rabbinical restrictions placed. Eggs is included in that. A non-Jew cooks the eggs. It will be a problem of bishalakim. Vegetables. What could be wrong with healthy, delicious vegetables? I'm a vegan. I'm a vegetarian. I don't want to eat castorium and civet and carmine and all these beetles. What could be wrong with vegetables? Well, insects. Believe it or not, the Food Drug Administration, their permissibility of inspections on insects is really there in order not to have a significant concentration that would cause you an upset stomach would be disgusting and repulsive on someone eating it. If it's below that threshold, it's perfectly fine. Now, many people will say, well, you know, I grew up, vegetables, there was no problem, and now we hear so many rabbis speaking about vegetables and checking insects. The answer is, years ago, there was something called DDT. What DDT was, they used to spray the fields for insecticides in order, or insecticides in order to kill all the bugs, and it did a wonderful job. The problem is, other people claim, you know, it was hurting the ecosystem, global warming, and, you know, all the other stuff that came from it, and they stopped doing DDT. Uh, shortly thereafter, suddenly, word spread amongst insect communities, uh, there's no more DDT, let's go feast, and let's go back to our vegetables. There's... Two insects you can see here on the screen. If you can see right there, that's an aphid. That's a thrips. Um, thrips and aphids are very common on a lot of greeny vegetables. And often you're not going to notice it. For example, aphids are green. How do you go ahead and tell it on a green leaf? Well, there's very easy ways to check it. A green leaf of lettuce is translucent. Anybody know what's the difference between translucent and transparent? Pretty good, close enough. Transparent, you can see through. Translucent allows light to go through. So a lettuce is translucent. The insect is not. So what ends up happening is, you know, a lot of times people want to check vegetables for insects, and they don't know how to check it. So they'll take a flashlight, and they'll look at the lettuce. They'll look at the lettuce, and they'll look down, and they don't see the insect. But suddenly, if you turn the flashlight this way, or you have a light box, or you hold it up to the light in the room, and you look right through the lettuce, the light's going to shine through, but the bug is not translucent, and you'll identify the bug. This is just a quick little video on a strawberry. Imagine if this insect right there was a little bit smaller and dead, right? A dead insect you still not only eat. It looks exactly like the seeds on the strawberry.
You know, and you have to know what you're looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, and there's various different charts that you could find out what it is and be able to test it. Machinery could be a problem. What was produced in that machinery? What was cooked in that machinery? Pasteurization, we said it kills bacteria, but it's a pot, technically, it's pipes. But it, but it heats the food, and you could technically have a juice, a Snapple, which is all kosher ingredients, but it was pasteurized on the same type of equipment that was used for non-kosher grape juice. Now suddenly, your kosher Snapple becomes not kosher. Milk, and in the US, milk, unless stated otherwise, comes from a cow, so you're more or less safe. When you're traveling outside the US, that's not necessarily true. Certifications, there's so many certifications out there. How do you know what's a good certification? Well, there's a website, the CRC from Chicago, that I recommend people Google and look at it. They have a very good extensive list on certifications. So there's all different levels of kosher certification. Again, what is a good hashkacha? What's a good certification and what's not? There's four national hashkachas. The OU, the OK, the K, and the Star K. Those are four of the big, the big four, as they call it. Like There's the big four accounting firms. There's the big four... Hashkachas. Then there's a whole bunch of smaller ones. Many local communities have their own vadam, which is small local hashkachas, and many of them network together and they work together. How do you know what's a good, you're traveling? How do you know if it's good or not? It's hard. I was recently in uh, an area of California that's not, really po not heavily populated by Jews, Orange County, California. And there was various different supervisions there. So I called Los Angeles, a rabbi I know in Los Angeles, just to find, to get his feel, it's closer to him than it is to where I live in New Jersey, and just to get his feel on where could I eat, which supervision could I trust. And he told me, out of three supervisions, one is a no-go. Don't even go there. They're just rubber stamping. They're just trying to say that it's kosher, and it's not kosher. They have a lot of problems there. One, perfectly okay. I would eat there. The second one, it's okay. It follows the standards, but a rabbi that tries to be a little more stringent on what he eats, I wouldn't recommend he eats there. You want to know if it's strictly kosher? It's strictly kosher. But, you know, there, there's certain levels uh, of stringency that certain people, depending on where they're holding in Judaism, right? Not everybody adapts the same levels. We're not talking about what's forbidden and, and permitted, but there is a concept. A holy Jew will fast for 40 days before, uh, before Yom Kippur. Not everybody Jew does that. So certain, depending where you're holding in life, if something is forbidden, nobody could do it. If it's kosher, yeah, you could do it. But, you know, like there, there's a certain level of stringency depending on who you are, and it's important for people to know who, where it is and when it calls for a stringency. He says, I personally don't eat there. I wouldn't recommend you eat there. But now I found out the CRC, and I encourage people to Google it, the Star K has a list as well, where they have a pretty extensive list of organizations across the US of symbols that you could trust. The OU, as a policy, would not comment on any other uh, supervision. I guess they feel that they could lose more than gain uh, because they hope to work with the people and they don't want to alienate them, so they wouldn't offer any comment unless you know somebody personally there, but as a, an official statement, they wouldn't, but you got it from the CRC and the Star K, they're willing to do so, and that really helps consumers out. So crcweb.org uh, or on the Star K's website, they uh, have a very good extensive list and, e and even have a card that you could print where you could keep it in your wallet that has uh, many of the popular hashkachas. So you're not gonna have all few thousand, but you'll have the top 20, top 30. Mysterious K. A K is not is a letter of the alphabet. It's not a, something you could trademark. Anybody could use the letter K. Not everybody could use a U with a circle around it. And on the contrary, when a kosher certification finds out that somebody is labeling products with their certification, they will go out guns blazing in court 
to stop them in order to intimidate anyone who even contemplates using their trademark because that's the only way th their, their whole value is in trust. And you need to be able to trust that if this trademark, if this symbol appears on a product, that means that it's certified. You can't have that with the letter K. However, there are, like you see here on the screen, two popular companies that people eat that all they have is a K just because they don't want anything more. They want to have the flexibility to be able to switch a certification without alarming their customers if something happened. So Pepsi, for example, is under supervision for many years under Rabbi Khalap. Very reliable certification, but they just bear a K. Sometimes you'll find drinks that can have a different type of supervision listed on the bottle, and that's just because the actual syrup is made under, let's say, Rabbi Harlap's supervision or Coke, regardless where you go in the U.S., whether it appears in OU or not, the syrup is coming from Coke in Atlanta, and that's under the OU supervision, and you can rely on it. There are bottling plants that could have their own supervision. So, for example, it's not economical for Coca-Cola to ship all across the world ready-made soda. It weighs a lot, and freight will be pretty expensive. So the syrup is produced in a central location, and then it goes to a bottling facility where they mix water into the syrup based on an approved concentration that Coca-Cola approves, and they bottle it with the labels that Coca-Cola provides, and then they sell it locally. A bottling plant technically that only produces cold items does not need a supervision. However, some choose for marketing purposes to get a supervision and they'll put a supervision on it. So you might have a different supervision for two different bottles depending where it's produced, but it has a, uh, the syrup still comes from the same source. If it's a drink, such as a Snapple, which is pasteurized, that needs supervision in its, in its plant because there it's heated and it's actually could come into contact with, with an non-kosher source. Rice Krispies. Right now, many of the Rice Krispies are actually under the OU and many boxes bear the K. So Kellogg's, I shouldn't say only Rice Krispies, Kellogg's, the Kellogg's K is something that can be relied upon. All K means is somebody, for some reason, somewhere, felt that it should be treated as kosher. Yep. Oh. There's no guidelines. Now, there was actually some landmark rulings in New York and elsewhere where the government got involved in saying you can't go ahead and market meat as being kosher unless it, fell, it follows certain standards. However, there, there, is, there, is a, uh, uh, there was a much controversy going over to the, the past century in implementing those laws and the like, that doesn't apply to all products and definitely not on a national level, definitely not with the K. The, the argument in Jersey was that why shouldn't the conservatives be able to also say what's kosher? Yeah, definitely. So again, you need to know. Now, one, one point I have to mention. People always say, a Jew is trusted, right? We trust Jews. So why, if there's a rabbi says it's kosher, why can I trust him? The answer is, kosher supervision is not only about trust. There's two aspects for kosher supervision. Number one is policies, and B, trust that you're instituting and implementing those policies. I could have a different standard of kosher than you. Doesn't mean you're not trustworthy. You are trustworthy in what you feel and deem as kosher. My standards could be different than you, so I have to know, do you have that same standard? And the Four certifying bodies, national bodies, the OU, the Star K, and the Chaf K, they work very much hand in hand together, even in some cases where there's a disagreement. But since they know ultimately everybody has to use each, each, each other's ingredients, so on the ingredient level, generally they'll go with opinion that meets the opinion of all four just because there's a lot cross mixing of ingredients that the end product will be an OU product, but they're relying on a Star K ingredient that, that was involved for a flavor of that product. Eating in an unsupervised establishment. There is many stories, unfortunately, where people who wanted to 
make some money. And yes, a Jew is trustworthy. But when you're having a tough time making ends meet, sometimes you compromise on principles you normally wouldn't otherwise compromise. And therefore, we instituted a policy that establishments need to have a supervision. How much of a supervision depends on the nature of the business. So for example, how often does the Orthodox Union visit Coca-Cola's plant? Not as much as they would have to visit your corner store down the block. Why? Because a large company like Coca-Cola, there's a trace log of every ingredient that's produced. They don't just, you know, I'm running short on something, go out and, and, and get it. There's official logs of what's used. There's board meetings that are held, or executive meetings at least, that are held before there's an ingredient swap that's done. There's a very strong contract where they have to share that information with the Orthodox Union before any changes happen. So you could get a certain level of comfortability, especially if there's no non-kosher ingredients in an entire plant, and spot checking such a plant just to make sure that everything is still continues the same is enough, while your local restaurant that could be running short on duck sauce and send somebody around the block to go pick it up is a whole different story. So the level of supervision is needed depends on, on the nature of the business. Slurpees. Are they kosher or are they not kosher? Yes, many Slurpees are kosher. Some might not be. How do you know if it's kosher, if it's not kosher? Fortunately, again, we have wonderful people who do research for us, so we don't have to guess. And these are two links, again, the CRC website, the Star K's website, where they have a good extensive list on which Slurpees are kosher, which are not, and where you, what you can rely on, et cetera. I definitely encourage people to find out. How about our lovely joint Starbucks? Can I get a coffee? The answer is perhaps. <laughs> now, Starbucks is not only a coffee house. Starbucks created a culture. It's genius in marketing on how they were able to not just create a product, but create a lifestyle, create an industry, and then a lifestyle around it. And the way their stores are architected, it became a culture that now it's a thing. You know, you don't go out with somebody to have water. In England, you might go out to have tea. Coffee became that drink here in, in the US. And it's really amazing on how someone could actually create a culture from a product. But part of the culture is to have a whole range of products, whether you're dealing with a frappuccino, an espresso, and this latte, and the name goes on and on. Some can be kosher, some could have kosher sensitive ingredients. So for example, frappuccinos now are on many uh, approved lists. For years, Frappuccino wasn't, and, and years ago, it was actually they switched some of the ingredients, some of the flavors that were used in producing a Frappuccino because it, came, had a, it contained flavors that came from insects. So, and for me, it was puzzling. For years, people, everybody was getting, you know, I can't survive without that Frapp. All right, I need that Frappuccino. What about the lists? So now, fortunately, the Starcade does have it on their list. But the bottle of Frappuccinos bear a, a supervision uh, on the actual bottle. But you have to really check what ingredient you're getting, uh, what drink you're getting to see if it's on the list. Now, additionally, there is some level of controversy when it comes to Starbucks. And some Starbucks establishments more than others. There's your kiosk Starbucks, which you often find in the airport, that they're basically just having some cold snacks and uh, coffee. And then there's a full-service Starbucks that serves meat and, and all the other types of dishes there, where all their plates and, and forks and utensils all get washed in the same dishwasher together. Does that cause a problem or not? For example, the brew basket, which is used in the actual coffee-making process, right? It's the basket that, that's holding uh, 
uh, your beans that are getting ready for, for brewing is washed in that dish machine, which, uh, they, they, which is a several compartment layered sink or dishwasher, does that cause a problem or not? Now, technically speaking, there is many, many grounds to be lenient on it, and it would not forbid it. I know some rabbis, when I spoke about the topic, said at the end of the day, you wouldn't have that in your house, right? You're not going to use one dishwasher and put in meat and dairy and non-kosher and mix it all together and rely on the soap concentration and how it kills it and, and, and the cycles and, and, and the like, which quite possibly is true. Um, I wouldn't have that in my house, but not that it's forbidden, meaning there's certain levels when people eat, they're going to make sure they'll have a tablecloth in their home and they'll make sure that they're not going to put food even if it's on a plate that's not touching the table, they'll still have a tablecloth. Technically speaking, the food's not touching the table, there's no grease there, it's on a plate, it's fine. Yeah, there's a certain lifestyle, and, and it's beautiful that people adapt certain levels of, of practices, but often when a person is traveling, you wanna know what's strictly kosher, what's not strictly kosher. Um, so, yes, there are very strong grounds for leniency on getting Starbucks products, does everybody agree? No. Do some say, again, you wouldn't have this in your house? Yes. So there are various different opinions. I'm not going to render my opinion on it, but again, there's very, very strong grounds for leniency in that aspect. Last but not least, the kosher kitchen, and then we'll take some uh, questions. The kosher kitchen in your home. How to keep a kosher kitchen? We just talk, spoke about all the products that are out there and yes, it's so easy to actually get kosher. But how about in your home? You know, I was reminded recently, uh, I once heard someone who said, in my house, I keep kosher. When I go out to eat, there, you know, like I, I rely leniently even when leniencies aren't acceptable. So the rabbi who was telling that told him, he says, great, so all your dishes are going to go to heaven. What does that have to do with you? Right? You keep kosher at home, so your dishes will go to heaven. Be you. You're the same person. You've got to eat kosher all around, whether you're home, whether you're out of home. You want to know in certain pressing situations, um, there you're, you're only going to find, follow what's strictly kosher, and by other cases, maybe you want to have some best practices, that's fine. But to compromise on what's strictly kosher is something that's not recommended. Now, in your home, your oven. Inside your oven, there's steam. Sometimes you don't see it because there's wet steam and there's dry steam, right? When steam starts condensing and it's not as hot, you can feel it on the walls of the oven. When it's very hot, you can't really see it. It's a dry steam, but there's steam. If, let's say, I use a non-kosher oven or I put meat and dairy in my oven, there's steam that travels. It's advisable. If a person has two ovens, great. If not, Dedicate your oven for either meat or dairy. One, you could keep it uncovered. So let's say you like your meat roasts generally uncovered, so then classify this oven as a meat oven. And then dairy, if you want to use dairy in that oven, a single sheet of silver foil is good enough, just cover it, and this way it doesn't produce enough steam for it, for it to leave. A microwave, many rabbis recommend a double covering, just because a microwave actually survives on steam. The way a microwave works is if you're going to put in a dry substance that has zero liquid, it won't get hot. Well, the way a microwave works is the liquid is actually what gets hot. So when I put in a chicken into the microwave, it's the moisture in the chicken that gets hot, and that heats the surrounding food solid that's around it. If you put in a cube of sugar, for example, a dry cube, it will remain cold. So a microwave really works on steam a lot more than an oven, and many rabbis recommend a double covering for that. So let's say you're using this microwavable dish surrounded by something else. Your dishwasher, using it for both meat and dairy, is not recommended because, again, inside the dishwasher, just look in that drain. It's full with everything, and it gets all splattered with hot water and the like. It's not recommended if you only have one dishwasher, so wash one in the sink and use one dishwasher for meat. Sinks. Technically, you could, use, you could have one sink. However, if you're going to put 
food on the bottom of the sink, and there's hot water in the sink, and you could have other items that are still in the sink that aren't clean, you're, you're, you're opening yourself up for problems. It's recommended, therefore, that a person should have two sinks if he has a luxury, or at least have a basin inside the sink, like different racks, keep things a little leveled, or don't put things into the sink, just wash it while you're holding it. But again, there is strict practice, strict what we call halacha, and then there's best practices. Best practices is not always stringencies. Best practices is sometimes to avoid a problem, so you don't have to, in panic, call over a rabbi, what should I do? So you organize yourself in a way that there shouldn't be problems. Having different utensils for meat and dairy. These are some basics. And if you want to start fresh, there's many people you can speak to on how to uh, kosher a kitchen.